Hey guys, I'm back to working on the pair of Motorola VT71s and hope to wrap them up in this installment. I heard back from the owner and he would like them to be fully reassembled. However, before I do, I need to finish up a little bit of electrical work. In the last installment, I believe I tracked down the source of some interference and I also recently created some replica ballasts. More on these in a moment. And I installed a retrace suppression modification on the other chassis. I want to do the same modification to this one. And I also talked, I believe, about installing a TVS diode across the CRT filament. And that's what I'm working on now. That's what this black device is right here. So on this side, that is common return or B- minus for the set. And this side is the CRT filament. In other words, we're right over here. V14 is a CRT, so there's the common return, and then there's the other side. Here's what the packaging for them looks like. So I'm with 11 volt TVS diodes. Now notice it says 1500 watts. That's an awful lot of power. That is not continuous. Check out the next one. It says ESD suppressors. That's what these are intended for. Short suppressing short bursts of voltage like static electricity imagine you're walking across the carpet and you go to reach for a sensitive piece of test equipment like these here and you were to touch something and it discharges into the device you don't want to fry the sensitive electronics so you put something like this on there and it will clamp it it's essentially uh, Zener diodes two of them oriented in either direction so it will not allow the voltage across them to exceed a certain threshold so I'll fire this up and show you the effect it has. So right now the I got the line voltage well below uh, what it would typically be and this is what we see. Now that bottom of the sine wave being clipped has nothing to do with the TVS diode that has to do with my ballast. Remember I'm using diode droppers these two big black diodes here to reduce the filament voltage so I don't have to use such massive power resistors. But if I increase the line voltage, you'll see the TVS diode kick in when it starts clipping off the positive portion. So there's the clipping effect. It will not allow the voltage across that filament to exceed this threshold. Not necessary, strictly speaking, but uh, it's a nice bit of uh, peace of mind, imagine you get a big voltage surge going into this set through the AC line, it will um, limit the voltage on that CRT and uh, hopefully uh, save it if ever such an event was to occur. Alright, so now retrace suppression. This chassis is a little bit different than the other one. It's a little bit earlier revision. So what I want to do refresh your memory is this is a TS-18 this is a later chassis when Motorola themselves incorporated the retrace suppression so you got orange wire pin 3 comes down around over here now on this set pin 3 is just going to common return this bus down here but the modification we want to make is to have it go to a junction they have a 250 picofarad cap and a 220k resistor well if you look at the original schematic for this set it's actually got a 250 picofarad cap. This guy right here. It's going to pin 5 at a 6SL7 just like we need. But instead of going to a 220K resistor, it's going to the common. So what I want to try doing is cut this connection here, insert a resistor, then reroute this orange wire here over to that junction and see if that does the trick. Unfortunately, I don't have any spare lugs. I lucked out on the other chassis, and I did. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think what I will do is dig up a terminal strip that just has two lugs and attach one of them here and leave the other one kind of hanging in free space. Like they, like they did here for this guy. For the video out to give me a tie point for my extra components. Now I want to talk about the ballast again for a little bit. Um, so here's the original prototype I'd made a while back. I've used it on a number of projects. It's held up just fine. 
and here's the one I made for this set, and it has failed. What failed was this resistor. 10 ohm, looks kind of small, but it's actually rated for 1 watt. The prototype, I used a 39 ohm, I think it's a 3 watt resistor. Well, uh, wattage is current square time resistance, so I figured if uh, a 39 ohm 3 watt was doing fine, then if I cut uh, the resistance down to a quarter, that I could get by with a smaller wattage resistor. However, that is not the case. And I also noticed this one's a bit discolored, so I'm thinking 3 watts isn't quite enough. So the problem with rebuilding these ballasts is not quite sure what wattage resistor to use. Now the, for the filament strings, yes, because we know that there's 300 milliamps going through each of the filament strings. But what about 37 and the 200 in the B plus, B plus plus circuitry? Not quite sure. Well, one easy thing you can do is build one uh, that's uh, got some big beefy resistors in there and measure the voltage drop and then you can calculate. Uh, so uh, I made a bad assumption and I think part of the problem is that this 200 ohm runs pretty cool and I'm thinking a power is current square times resistance so if the 200 ohm is running pretty cool a much smaller resistor, in this case 10 ohm with the same current running through it should be just fine however look more closely Yes, B++ is going all through the 200 ohm, but we've also got this lead up here going off to some other circuitry in the video amp. So there's actually two paths for the current, and the sum of those all eventually goes through this guy. So this resistor has more current going through it than that guy. And power is a function of the square of current, so definitely an increase in current is going to make a more significant uh, increase in the power than increasing the resistance will. Alright, so what's that resistor even there for? Well, I was considering eliminating it altogether. What it's really there for is originally this had selenium rectifiers in it. They cannot handle a high surge current. That's a current limiter. Using silicon, it can handle a much higher surge current. Not infinite, but uh, certainly a lot higher. So I figured, well, I'll go down to 10 ohms. I won't take it out altogether. And I also have this um, CL90 in series with everything going so it's effectively in here. So all the current has to go through this guy for the entire set. So even if I took this out completely, there would still be some current limiting thanks to the thermistor. So what I should have done is put this prototype back in there or replace the 10 ohm and put this back in there and actually measure the voltage drop across it and see how... Uh, what uh, kind of power is really going on and then you want to at least double that so say that the part is dissipating 2 watts use a 4 or better a 5 watt resistor so that's what I'm going to be doing I think I'll put this guy back in and measure the voltage drop across both the 200 ohm and in this case 39 ohm and make a note of that and also I picked up some of these guys these are uh, thermistors. So these are CL90s. These are 120 ohms cold and they're rated for 2 amps max steady state. In this set it's got more like 1 amp and 1 amp steady state will produce around 4 or 5 ohms when it reaches operating uh, temperatures. These are 220 ohm cold and they're a lot smaller. Um, so I think uh, I was I'm thinking of swapping out my CL90 for these because it will fit inside this housing with more room to spare. Now how do they get by using a smaller package? Simple, they get hotter. They're hotter in a smaller volume, but uh, that really shouldn't be an issue here. That's not near any critical circuitry that would be affected by heat. Also, these are less expensive, and because they have a higher cold resistance, double what the CL90 is, it'll be even a softer start on power up. All right, so I'm gonna get busy. Uh, I'm tinkering with this and I will let you know what I come up with for a final design. Alright, I've taken some measurements and done some math and I'm glad I've got a true RMS scope 
and a multimeter because that is a waveform across the 39 ohm resistor. It is certainly not your typical sine wave. So that complex waveform translates to about 11 volts RMS. So if we plug that in, 11 volts RMS, 39 ohms, gives us about 280 milliamps, which translates to about 3 watts. So no wonder that 3 watt resistor down there has gotten discolored because I'm really pushing it right at the edge of its operating capabilities. Now what about the other resistor, the 200 ohm, which feeds B++. That only had 17.5 volts DC across it, which translates to 87.5 milliamps. So, for lack of a better term, I'm calling this B++. That has quite a bit of current going through it. And, uh, it's about 200 milliamps going up here, and only about uh, 87.5 going through here. So no wonder that resistor was getting toasty. I just realized I have that line on the wrong side, actually. That should be <laughs> over here, going up that way. Alright, so what about when I have a 10 ohm resistor in there? Well, assuming the current's going to stay about 280, that translates to about 0.78 watts. So again, pushing the limit of a 1 watt resistor. Putting in a 2 watt 10 ohm probably would have held up all right. Or what I think I'm going to end up doing, I've already done it to another ballast I made, was to go with a smaller resistor and increase the wattage. So it was a 3.3 ohm, 3 watt resistor. Again, the primary purpose of that is to uh, limit the surge going into those diodes and to drop a bit of voltage. Silicon rectifiers, yes, they're more efficient than the selenium. These voltages are going to be higher than spec out with the selenium rectifier, but these se sets seem to run better on a little bit higher B++, so I'm not too concerned about that. Mostly just want to limit the current going through this set. Alright, so with those numbers in hand, I'm going to rebuild the other ballast as well and uh, swap out these thermistors for the smaller ones. Also, on this guy, I dropped the 200 ohm down to 180. Well, 200 ohm is in a standard value, so you either go with 220 or 180. In this case, I went with uh, 180. And it may not look like it, but that is actually a 2 watt resistor. And uh, with a smaller 180, using 2 watts, uh, probably 3 watts would be a better idea for that guy than a 2 watt doesn't hurt to go overkill on these resistors. The bigger you go, the cooler they'll run, the longer they'll last. I'm working on putting the first of the sets back together now. I did a video a while back where I really went through how these sets are put together in detail, so I'm not going to go over it in such depths right now, but I want to touch on a few things. Uh, notably that this is uh, probably the goofiest of the early TVs as far as how it's constructed. And, uh, well, <laughs> it was an inexpensive set, so they did cut some corners, uh, in particular the way the CRT is mounted. Uh, the front is supported by the mask, and the original mask was made out of some early type of foam material that is almost always deteriorated. It kind of looks like it's melted. And uh, it, it, it actually gets hard over time. But it turns out that it dissolves rather easily with some warm water. And uh, luckily somebody's already done that work for me. And they fabricated uh, a new mask with um, some of this tubular foam insulation. Now that is all that supports the bulk of the CRT, so the face nestles down in that and surrounds it. And then on the neck, well, we've got a, a cone shield here, and that fits into well, basically like some aluminum duct tape that they wrapped around the rest of the neck. And then there is an aluminum piece of strip metal that they corrugate a bit here to provide some strain relief and that is just screwed into this wooden bracket so you can imagine here if you over tighten this you'll shatter the neck 
And uh, that's it. That's all that supports the pitcher tube in these sets. So when these get shipped, uh, they uh, can get damaged. In fact, I bought one a while ago uh, that did get uh, destroyed in shipping. Is what happens is that front mast deteriorates. Only thing supporting it is this neck support. This sags and snaps the neck off. But anyway. So I've got that reattached, and now, as I mentioned, there's a shield on here. Well, that shield needs to get grounded so that actually does run a wire over to the speaker frame. Well, one side of the speaker frame is going to one of the lugs, and these two plug into the chassis, and you want to make sure you get it right. So the black one goes to the one that goes to the frame, which goes to the CRT shield, and down below that is going to the chassis, I do believe. So that's how <laughs> you make sure everything gets grounded and shielded properly. Goofy for sure. Alright, so and there's the speaker. Now one of the screws is gone, but with the other three there, that's very secure. Up on top here, we do have a piece of asbestos. I'm just going to leave it alone. It is there because it goes right above that ballast. The original ballast got very, very hot. So they did that to prevent the, the wood from charring, I guess. Alright, so I'm going to flip this around and make sure that the CRT looks alright. And then slide the chassis in and start hooking things up. Also, uh, you don't want to tighten this too much because I have no idea if it's rotated quite right for the pitcher to be level. Uh, there's no uh, yoke or anything to rotate the center of the pitcher. Or to get a level, I should say, you actually have to physically rotate the entire pitcher tube. And you can't do that until you actually have it running and uh, see uh, what the image looks like. Here's what it looks like from the front. Not too bad, although I think that could push the CRT forward a little bit more. But <laughs> there's one little issue. There is a stray strand, I think, from the grill cloth running down in here and moving around with the static electricity I generate when I wave my hand over. So unfortunately, I've got to get in there and get that out. Boy, that's annoying. Gonna have to loosen up uh, this. Let's hold the CRT and slide it back, get in there and get that offending thread out of the way. Well, I got the set all back together and that, uh, that mask doesn't look too bad. Got some issues though. One, the pitcher's crooked. I kind of anticipated that would happen because uh, when you put the CRT in, you're kind of blind, and these don't have a uh, a yoke that you can that you can twist to straighten the level the pitcher out. The level the pitcher, I got to loosen up the bracket on the CRT neck and rotate the CRT. And if you do that while it's playing, there is a shock risk because you've got thousands of volts going to the CRT socket. Now the other issue just cleared itself up, which means I must have a loose connection somewhere. So, <laughs> all I did was I leaned on the cabinet a little bit. Oh, now it's back. There's weird diagonal waviness going on. Ah, it's curious. My thought is that that uh, grunt there, now it's back. That's not really at an angle, the whole picture's at an angle, so we got a ripple going in the horizontal circuitry. Now it's gone. And now it's back. So that'll be fun to track down. Well, <laughs> it's a charm of old TVs, just bang on them a little bit to, to make them work right. <laughs> Otherwise, the set's playing extremely well. Seven, six, four, five, baby. I'll get flagged for a uh, copyright violation because I just did that. The other thing I gotta uh, work on is the knobs. I don't think any of these are the original. The outer knobs sure look like the original, except when you look real close, they're a little bit mottled. So I think these might have actually come from Motorola radio. They use the same knobs on a number of radios. But they're so close, nobody would ever know the difference. However, the channel knob and fine-tuning are definitely not originals. The fine-tuning looks like this, only it's smaller. And the channel selector should not be hollowed out in the middle like this. And it should uh, be easier to grip. This one's completely smooth all around. 
So let's see what I can dig up. The right reproduction's made. Uh, so that's one possibility. I also want to put some felt behind these, like this. Otherwise, these knobs scratch into the cabinet, which has been refinished, but not by me. But he did a pretty decent job. I think it's just been strip stained and then polyurethane. Anyways, uh, yeah, I'll see what I can do for the knobs. And uh, rotate that picture tube. All right, one down, one to go. The set on top is all back together and working well. And I was able to dig up a complete set of knobs for it between the two sets. Now for the lower set, it looks like we got the two correct outer knobs, but not quite. I was surprised when I pulled this one off and took a closer look at it. This is actually a homemade reproduction. Somebody made a mold and cast one. I know that because it's solid on the back, whereas the original is hollow with some webbing to uh, add stability. Did a decent job. I thought about doing it myself many times, but uh, I've gotten around to it. So that leaves a channel and fine-tuning. Channel, I might be able to dig something up. Fine-tuning on these sets is always a challenge. Small inner knob. The outer knobs were also used on a number of radios, and that's why a lot more of these show up than these guys. But reproductions are made that are uh, good quality, so if need be, I can uh, buy one, but it's up to the owner how much he wants to spend on the set. Now the lower set's got a little issue. I don't have a signal source hooked up, but even so, I think you can see the problem. The picture is tilted like so. It's the one really annoying thing with these sets is, because they don't have a yoke that you could twist to level out the picture, you actually have to rotate the picture tube, which is held in place with a tight clamp. And uh, so I'm going to have to reach around back and unloosen the screw and slowly level it out. Be careful not to shock myself because you got up, upwards of 6,000 volts going to the wires in the back of the CRT. So uh, what I normally do is I loosen it, I guesstimate how much you need to twist it with the set turned off, turn it back on, see how good I did, turn the set back off, twist it a little, turn the set back on, see how I did, and so on until I get it level. I went digging through my knob stash and came up with a few Motorola knobs. So I'm going to try using this for the channel, this for the fine tuning, and I got a pair of these for the outer knob. So here's a replica somebody made. It's an okay job, you can see they clearly didn't get the details of the three concentric rings. You can see how it looks with a solid back, and here's what the original is. Now these are neural shafts, and over time the plastic tends to uh, wear away a little bit, the knobs can get loose. So a couple things you can do. One is, you notice these are split, so you can pry these apart a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, you can put some filler in here. So on this one, I put a little bit of Eileen's Turbo Tacky Glue and let it set up. I don't want to glue these on, I just want to add some filler so there's a little more material to bite. So that's on there pretty solidly now. Here's the other one. And this one I've already put felt behind it. Again, I like to put felt on there so the knobs don't scratch up the cabinet. It's pretty common on these. When they haven't been refinished, you'll see uh, pretty deep scoring wear marks around the knobs. So, like so, trim that down a little bit so there's not so much sticking out. And fine tuning knob also is a bit loose, so I gotta add a little more filler to that. Another thing you can do is uh, wrap something like electrical tape around there, give it some more bite. And here's the channel knob. Again, also a bit loose. So that's what happens over time. These knobs are not made from the most durable material. Unlike Bakelite knobs, which tend to hold up really well, unless they uh, you know, chip or break, they uh, these early plastic knobs tend to wear away. So uh, you need creative. Um, glue if you know what the right type is. I'm not sure exactly what type of plastic this is. It might be tenite. 
so you could experiment with glue. Now one thing I don't recommend doing is putting some two-part epoxy on here and just sticking the knob on because down the road you probably want to take the knob off. So that's why I recommend using something like tape. You'll be able to pull the knob back off when time comes to, to pull the chassis out for servicing. Alright, that's the second set done. I got the picture all leveled and the knob secured. So it's going to wrap up this project. Hope you guys enjoyed this look at restoring a couple of Motorola VT71s from around 1948. Tell the boy the truth, Ray.